Hello friends, welcome to my channel, Soulful Spinning. My name is Lisa and I'm coming to you right from the suburbs of Chicago in the Midwest of the United States. Today is the 10th of February, 2023. And this is my little channel where I share my creative journey with wool and spinning, knitting, and other creative pursuits. We are in the midst of a winter breed study here at Soulful Spinning. I purchased right before Christmas a 12 sampler breed box from Hearthside Fibers, and I've made the commitment to do one breed every week. So this is, I believe, let's see. I'm gonna go look at my list here. Uh, today is Finnish, or Finn Sheep for short, and it is the seventh breed in the series. So uh, I have made a playlist that I'm putting all the winter breed study videos in. Um, they started on the 30th of December uh, with Black Welsh Mountain, and then lots of other cool breeds up to today, which is Finn. So Finn wool is the last of my European North, Northern European short-tailed family of sheep, and it's one of my favorites. As a matter of fact, Finn was the first fleece that I purchased after my first Shetland fleece. And it is a beautiful, beautiful fiber and definitely in the top three, four, five. I don't know, I love all wool, but Finn has a special place in my heart. So on my table here, I have some samples. I've got a cream color, I've got a gray, I've got a deep, dark, a brownish black. And then, of course, I have my sample from the combed top that came in the box. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with the breed study. As usual, one of my main sources for information is the Fleece and Fiber Source book, which is really a must-have for anybody that's interested in wool just for the sheer beauty of the book and also for the information contained therein. So I really, I mean, it's, it's becoming very well, well thumbed through. So let's see what we have to say about Finn. In Deb Robeson's and Carol Acarius's book, they give us a little information about Finn sheep as well. They're an ancient Scandinavian breed They can have a lot of litters, they call them three to four lambs is common. Uh, Finn's fleeces are light, averaging around five pounds. So it's a nice fleece for a hand spinner. It's not too much wool if you get an entire fleece. Their wool is described as silky, is more sleek than fluffy, which I have found in my experience as well. It has a very, it has a luster to it, not quite the luster you'd see in a true long wool, but it has a, a very elegant kind of sheen to the fiber and I found that spinning it worsted from comb top gives the best results. And I believe, I believe that's what she says here in the text as well. Uh, what else about Finn? Um, well, they can, just like a lot of the other northern European short-tailed breeds, they can come in a variety of colors from, from a creamy white all the way through to a black. And they also come spotted or piebald, I think they call it. And I actually have a fleece that's got multiple colors in it. Uh, I picked up a half fleece a while back that's, that has those multiple colors. Uh, it's low in grease. It was really easy. When I worked from the raw fleece, it was very easy to wash and prepare. And you didn't have to, I didn't have to use a lot of scouring because it was very low grease. Instead, it had a high yield. Uh, three to six inch staple, uh, depending on when they're shorn. I have a beautiful sample of fin wool from a lovely viewer who lives in Australia who sent me, <clears throat> excuse me, who sent me a, some locks from her beloved sheep there and they're quite, quite long, which I will show you as well. Uh, microns 24 to 31. She says here, um, silky feel, nice combination of softness and durability. And what did she say about the samples? The fleece was silky, shiny, and sweet.
So I'll show you my square. This is the Berlin Blanket by Kate Davies. And this is the tag that came with the, with the sample. And I have to say that I did not really enjoy the spin as much as I usually do with Finn with this sample. I was having trouble with distance of draft. I'm, I'm spindle spinning all these yarns and I'm spinning about 25 grams. This square weighs 14 grams. So if you're wondering you know, how much yarn is used, it depends, of course, on the weight of the yarn, if it's a heavier yarn or not. But I found that when I was drafting, I, I, it didn't feel very fluid. It just kind of felt like there was irregular lengths. And, and indeed, so what I ended up doing is I threw the, the fleece or the, the top on my hand combs and I combed out. I didn't do this for the whole spin. I only did it for half the spin. And all this came out of the back of the combs, which is, of course, usable fiber. But it's real, very, very short, uh, very, very downy and very short. So I think that was contributing to the uh, difficulty of the spinning process and, you know, do, doing a for, uh, short forward draw. But uh, the yarn came out surprisingly nice. I, I thought it was going to be quite irregular and I, I just was not, I'm not happy with how it turned out until the magic of washing the yarn and turned out just beautiful. Uh, here's the little bit that I have from my ball that I was knitting from. And it's just really, really beautiful. I was knitting this this morning in the sunshine and the sun on the, on the yarn just, it just glowed uh, in the sunshine. So, so there's my square. Now let's get into the fun stuff. The fleeces that I have here to show you. That's the real, for me, that's the real joy of working with wool is working from raw fleece and, and locks. Uh, I did, I actually, uh, I did a little something different with this top. I gave it a quick soak in cold water and I laid it out to dry. Uh, hoping to reactivate the crimp. Somebody gave me that suggestion. Uh, in addition to steaming the, the combed preparation, you can just give it a quick dip and dry it. And indeed, after it came out, it was really, it had a lot of a beautiful wave to it. And uh, you know, had more of that uh, quality, unprocessed quality, I, I would say. All right, so let me have a little sip of tea here. All right, so let me show you the very first fin uh, fleece that I purchased. I, I got from a shepherd, I think it was called Trimber Field Farm. And I contacted her and I was able to purchase uh, fleece. And I remember being sort of uh, not disappointed in the color, but I, I was expecting pure white. And, and this definitely is more on the creamy side kind of more of a yellowish uh, tinge to it. Um, let me pull out a lock for you. So it's really, really beautiful. Let's see, they're very tiny, tiny locks. They're not real bulky. You see, they're just, they got a nice crimp, but they kind of like skinny little, skinny little locks here. And I spun up this huge skein from that fleece. I think you can see that it's kind of on the yellowish end of the spectrum. It's not a pure white. It's a warm white. Trimberfield Farm. I don't know if she's still selling uh, wool or not, but really, really soft, really silky. This was one of my first spins I did on my uh, Lendrum Saxony. And I, I really should do something with it, don't you think? All right, so I got another fleece from the same shepherd. 
later on, I, I actually reserved a fleece. It's this one right here. Uh, she described it as black. Um, not, I think the, the weathered tips, it was coated. But again, you have that really sweet little, sweet little lock and really very, very strong. So let me, let me get myself. So I, you can listen to the transcripts. If I'm off screen and you, you, you want to hear what I, maybe you um, need to see my face, you can go and click on the transcript below and it'll, it'll give you a, captions on the bottom. And they're pretty accurate, uh, I would say, for me. So, you know, go ahead and feel free to do that. So what did I do with this? I, I tried carding it with my drum carter and I created this Hank. Oh, it's a really beautiful chocolatey brown. But I think carding really didn't bring out the luster of the fiber. Uh, it's got a lot of loft. Uh, it's a woolen, but this is woolen spun from carded. Right? Now I have another sample here <clears throat> that I pulled out. This is spindle spun from comb top. Just a beautiful, rich color. It has a little bit of fuzz on it here. Beautiful. Yeah, so much like Shetlands and Icelandic, you're, you're getting a wide variety of colors. So what else do I have to show you? All right, so I could, didn't, couldn't get enough of Finn, so I have a sample here as well. Here's some gray wool. Again, camera works better if it's not seeing my eyes. So this is a gray fleece. Yeah, where did I buy this one? I can't, I think I got this from a blue-faced Lester breeder, but she was working with a neighbor and she had some fin, uh, some fin to sell. And I have a whole bag of this and it's very, very consistent in color. It's really a beautiful gray. And here is a sample of that one. It's a pretty, pretty gray color. And nice and, I mean, it's a two-ply, but it's, it's quite, quite bouncy. So yeah, I thought those two colors look really pretty. And of course, the three colors really should be something. So yeah, I've been having a lot of fun with this breed study because it's making me go into the wool that I have and I'm sort of having a newfound appreciation for what I have and it is actually preventing me from making any other purchases because um, as you can see I have, <laughs> I have a lot of wool. So I was on Etsy and I found a breeder of fin wool some time ago and I purchased I think it was a half fleece and I think I've shown this fleece before in another episode. <laughs> you know, I'm opening these bags and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's so pretty. Let me show you up close this one. This is a spotted uh, fleece. It's got different shades of, of gray and like silver. And uh, this one's really, really silky. Let me pull out a lock here for you. It's on the short side. Um, I would say this is, I'm pushing it to say that it's three. It, it might be more like a two and a half, which is uh, kind of unfortunate because I think it would be even better. Maybe it's, it's a three inch staple, I would say, there. And it's this beautiful, beautiful, silky, silky fleece. And I have some more here just in a little bag. Look at that, you guys. Isn't that pretty? This is more of a steely gray here. Let me pull out a lock for you. Just absolutely beautiful. So this was a fleece named Bella. And I don't know. Let's see if I still have... I do have a little card in here 
Bella, Finn Moxley Farm. Here, I just did a little, I had my combs out the other day and I made a little nest. Look at that. Really, very, very silky. Like, just silky feeling. Like the scales don't even, yeah, just beautiful. Just beautiful, nice and clean. So yes, I got excited. And what am I, I'm storing this, a lot of people ask me, where do I store my wool? I usually store my washed wool in either um, fabric bags or sometimes I'll have old sheets and I'll roll it up in an old sheet. Um, in this case, I use this big lawn bag from Ace Hardware here <laughs> and I wrote on the bag uh, what it is. And Uh, I, I know that some people say you should uh, put it in airtight containers. I hate to put it in plastic if I can help it because um, I just feel like it can't breathe if it's in plastic. So, yeah, and no, no moths here because I think the rooms that I, uh, I actually have some, <laughs> I have some fleece in the laundry room. It's, I've got this corner between the, our second refrigerator and the wall. And I've got these bags, you know, stacked up. <laughs> it's like insulation for my house. <laughs> but I was digging, I took everything out the other day, and uh, yeah, everything's perfectly fine. It's, it's a well-lit room, and it's, uh, it's not, maybe, I don't know, I'm, I hope I'm not jinxing myself, but I haven't had any problems with, with moths. But I really do need to do something with all this wool, don't you think? I think I should. All right, so that's a kind of a, let's see, is that all I have in the way of fin? Yeah, so this is another way. This is in an old flannel pillowcase, and uh, I just took my gray wool, uh, my washed wool, and I, and I put it in there. And it's, it's fine. Um, now the, any raw wool that I have, that's not been washed. I will keep sometimes in a five gallon bucket, a la Judith, Judith McKenzie McCune. She tells us that it's okay to take your raw fleece and actually compress it down into a five gallon bucket and take out as much air as possible. Because she said that's how they uh, bundle up the bales of wool that they use for commercial preparation. And, sh and she says that, that that works for her. So. You know, you get different opinions. Some people say don't, you know, uh, it could grow mold. But her idea is you pack it really, really tight and you pack it full and then you, you cover it up and so there's no air circulating in there. And I've actually done that with some of my raw fleeces that I wasn't able to process, you know, in a timely fashion. Yeah, I, I actually do have, a, I have a couple of fleeces that are still in the grease upstairs that really need to get uh, washed up. I've got I think I've got some Romney, and I've got a Cory Romney cross that still needs to be scoured. But uh, usually I scour in the summer. Yeah, I don't really like to store raw, raw wool too much. Um, I like to get it at least washed. So one last sample of fin that I have here, and this was a, a lovely viewer that I have. She she had some sheep, and they were her babies in uh, in Australia, and she sent me these locks. I and if you've been following me for a while, you you may have seen these before, but I will show you again because these are incredible. So look at this; it's washed, and that's its length. A good six inches. And uh, what I did with this is I'm making just some singles yarn. I find that a longer staple makes a really great singles yarn. A singles yarn is just a single ply. You don't, uh, because I thought it would make, and it, I hope you can see um, the shine in this. It's, it's just beautiful. So yeah, she sent me this whole little organza bag 
full of these washed locks, and I think some of them she combed out, or she, um, yeah, so pretty. Look at the, there we go. They're, they're like folded over. <laughs> so this is going to be a job for my combs, I think. Or if you have something this long, uh, this long you could, uh, I, you could flick, take a dog brush, flick this side, flick this side, and spin it from the lock. Or you could, you could fold it over your finger and, and spin from the fold. But yeah, so beautiful. Thank you, uh, Terry. She sent this to me. So, um, and so I do have a little bit more here. This is just a little center pull ball that I I took off of my ball winder. So yeah, you can tell I like Finn, <laughs> right? What do you smell there? You smell something? So I've been getting the same question from a number of people, and the, it's, the question is to the effect that, how do you get the yarn off your spindle? So, you know, let's say you've got, I spun my, my uh, thin sample this week with this, these two of these, uh, two, two green sleeve spindles. Okay. And so I did film a little video yesterday on three ways to ply from your spindles. And I'll go ahead and insert this here and I hope you find it helpful. And then we'll be right back. I'll, I've got a finished object to show you and a, a book, a book to share and an acquisition. All right, I'll be right back and I hope you enjoy this little uh, video of how to ply from your spindles. So I get this question a lot from my viewers and that is how do you ply from your spindles? So here are my two spindles. Um, one of them's got a little bit more uh, wool on it than the other, but here are two spindles. The question always is, is how, how do I get these off of here and into a, plying, uh, into a plied yarn? So there's basically three ways that I ply from my spindles. The first way is to take the two spindles and create a center pull ball. And the way I'm gonna do that is take a small core um, this is just a little wine cork that I have, a little piece of a wine cork. And I'm going to start to tightly, I'm going to lay the spindles gently on the ground on the carpet. And then I'm just going to wind two strands together into a plying ball. And then I'm going to go to my wheel and spin. The singles are spun clockwise or with a Z twist. And so when I ply, I'm going to do anti-clockwise or S twist when I ply. The other way you can do it is to wind the two balls separately. So here, here are actually two balls that I took off of the Turkish spindle. So I've got two balls here. So once again, I can wind these together uh, into a plying ball, or uh, for, for sometimes I'll just what I'll do is I'll just uh, take the two and I'll just ply right from the balls at my wheel. Um, sometimes I'll put the, put the balls in a bowl or just hold them in my lap and then create tension and ply that way. So I'll demonstrate that as well. So that's the second way that I ply. And then the third way I ply is to use, use my ball winder. I have a ball winder. Many of you do probably if you're, if you're knitters. And I'll create a center pull ball and then I'll apply from the inside and the outside. So I will have some extra singles on this, bo uh, this bobbin, this spindle, uh, after I make my plying ball and I'll demonstrate that as well. So I hope you find this useful. I get this question all the time. How do you get them off? How do you get the yarn off your spindles? How do you, how do you apply off your spindles? So I'm just gonna take my two spindles and I'm just going to lay them on the floor. Just a quick public service announcement here. You can also put your spindles on a sofa or on a table if you're worried about them being on the floor. I'm going to get my two strands of yarn. And I like to wrap the yarn around a core 
so that it has something so the, the center won't collapse in on itself. Uh, I have done it without a cord. I haven't noticed that much of a difference, but you can use like a little rock or you could use a little piece of uh, felted wool. And then I'm just very tightly, with tension, wrapping it around the core. And then I always keep an eye on my spindles on the floor here, uh, making sure that they don't get caught in anything um, or wrapped around each other. So unlike when you're winding a ball f for knitting, where you want to have a loose tension, when you make a plying ball, you want to make sure it's nice and tight so that you have a nice evenly plied yarn. So yeah, I'm just going to sit here uh, and listen to some music or watch a podcast and I'll make my ball. And I'll show you what my spindles are doing on the ground as I wind this. You can see my, my spindles just resting on my foot here. Usually it'll just come right off the top of the spindle, or the bottom of the spindle. And this is what I would do too if I was just uh, winding a single ply off one of the spindles. I would do the same thing. Sometimes they kind of dance. You gotta be careful they don't get caught on anything. Uh, if you got a loopy carpet, you know, sometimes the hook can get caught and you don't want that to happen. All right, so I'm, I'm getting to the end of the one spindle. All right, so. I'm just gonna break it off here. So what I'll do is I'll just, again, I have a carpeted floor here, and I'll just rest the spindle on the floor, and then make a center pull ball, making sure that I keep track of the middle of the center here. So let me just move this movie up just a little bit more. Winder. <laughs> so yeah, I just, uh, oops, I lost it there. Sometimes I'll fold it a couple of times, the tip, so it has a little more, more grab there. So yeah, so then I'll just start winding it on. Now, the other thing you can do is you can actually just hold on to your your spindle and oftentimes the, the fiber will just, the singles will just come off the tip like this, you see? Uh, it doesn't always work. Uh, sometimes you have to stop it. But yeah, I'm just holding the spindle. Carpet down here has got pile and sometimes it'll get stuck. Yeah, so there you go, and it's wound up. Um, the other thing I'll do sometimes is just hold it in my hand as it winds off. So you just wanna uh, make sure you protect your hook on your spindle. You don't wanna get it bent or anything. Uh, it's gonna impact its performance, okay? So that's just a tiny bit here, and then I'll take it off my ball winder. And then I will uh, put the centers together. I like to uh, keep track of the middle uh, because uh, the, the problem with plying like this is sometimes when you get towards the end, 
everything gets really tangled up, especially if the singles haven't rested and they still have a lot of energy from the spin. So this isn't my preferred way of doing it, but I, uh, it, it does work, you know, if you've got, especially if you've got a little bit of extra. The other thing you can do is just use your ball winder, make two balls from two different spindles, and then apply them together from the two balls. So you just have to experiment and try, try different ways and, you know, see what works best for you and gives you the results that you want. All right, let's go over to the wheel and we'll go ahead and do some plying. tension. One, two, three, and on. One, two, three, and on. One, two, three, and on. I'm going to test it. It's pretty good. So, one, two, three, and on. One, two, three, and on. And on. One, two, three, and on. One, two, three, and on. And then the ball just sits in my lap. One, two, three, and on. One, two, three, and on. Move my, my little center pull ball. Take the two ends, put in a loop here. I usually fold it over and then start spinning in this direction. And then, yeah, and then just, sometimes you gotta do a little wiggle wheel as it's plying here. Now let me see how my ply looks. Looks okay. Oops, too much tension. And then I'm just smoothing it down. I do this instead of those um, applying bracelets. I've never um, managed to figure out how to do a applying bracelet. Almost to the end of this. And towards the end, you just have to be careful it doesn't twist up. Sometimes it twists up on itself. But this one actually, and then what I'll do too is I will cut, because it's a loop basically there. And there's my little sample piece. Let's see how the ply looks. That looks okay. So for this little guy, this little bit here, I'm gonna use this mini tiny nitty knotty I picked up this years ago. You can't get these anymore. It's got a little man on there. Do you see? It reminds me of the Dancing Men, that Sherlock Holmes story. So I'm just going to take it off here, and then I will show you how to do the other two, um, the other two plyings.
So that's, those aren't the only ways that you can ply from your spindles. There's, I'm sure other people have other ways of doing it. Uh, really, if you just wind the two balls separately and just apply them from, you know, holding them in your hand or putting them in some bowls, that works fine. I really do like my, my ball winder if I have a small sample and I just ply from the inside and the outside. So do you have any good ways of plying from spindles? That if you have a way that really works for you, if you could make a comment below, um, we would really appreciate that. All right. So finished. Yay, I've got a finished object. Of course, it is so warm out here. It, it's, what's the temperature today here? It's crazy. Uh, the weather today is 38 degrees Fahrenheit. It feels really spring-like. And it's going to get into the 50s, almost 60 degrees on when next Wednesday. So, yeah, where's winter? I don't know. But um, if you've been following me for a while, this is my finished Lopa Pesa jumper. And I finished this this week. This has not been blocked. So... I do want to give it a cold, uh, not a, a, a complete wash and block, but I am really happy the way the yoke turned out. I did not go to a larger size needle for the yoke, and it turned out fine. I made sure to really spread the floats and not compress them together when I was doing the yoke. Uh, I knit this on a four and a half millimeter US nine, th and then I used a size uh, seven, a four and a half millimeter for the the folded. Uh, I did a folded um, neckband and for the ribbing on the edges here. So I will get some uh, pictures of me wearing this uh, outside. <laughs> Obviously, this is not something you're going to wear inside the house. And um, either in this, today's episode or in a future episode, I will show you what it looks like. So. Um, I'm making a ma I want to make a matching hat for this. So I'm under I'm underway for that. So and, and the book I want to share with you from my bookshelf has to do with what I'm going to do with my hat to match my jumper. So yeah, I finished is really happy. It fits me uh, quite well and I will definitely I will definitely put it on for you and show you what it looks like. So thanks for all your uh, encouragement and patience. <laughs> I now am thinking about my second one. I want to do a neutral colors and I want to do a zip cardigan. So I think I'm going to do it out of Alifos Lopi or holding maybe Plutolopi triple for Alifos. I'm not really sure, but I got a pattern in mind. All right, so from my bookshelf, so I have two books that are kind of related, so I thought I would show them both to you today. And both books are by Mary J. Mucklestone, and one of them is Scandinavian motifs, and the other one is uh, Fair Isle motifs. And I pulled these books out because I'm looking for a stitch pattern that I could put on the brim of my hat. So both of these books are amazing. They have all these different patterns and the charts to go with it. It has information on uh, knitting stranded with two hands, you know, various ways, and also various ways to, to knit. She also has information in here, just that she's got an essential skills, basically an essential skills section. Circular knitting, stranded, stranding, steaking, applying motifs to projects, so she's got information in here about steaking, using a crochet steak or sewing, which is what I would have to do if I make my uh, my zip up. I don't even know how to sew in a zipper, so but, but I, I hope I can do it. Traditional garments, uh, using motifs, experimenting with motifs, adapting patterns. I mean, it's just a wealth of information in here. And I wanted to just show you the motif directory. So in, in both of the books, uh, the Fair Isle one, which is for some reason is a little bit bigger. And this one, you have, the, you have sort of a glossary at the beginning 
and then it references the page. You know, it tells you how many rows, uh, what the stitch count is, like here's in beautiful, beautiful knitted swatches of all, all the patterns. I can, I can only imagine how much work went into uh, putting these books together. Incredible. Yeah, and then this one is just uh, the Fair Isle. A lot of the information is similar, but it's more based on the Fair Isle 2 stranded in the Shetland patterns. So I'm thinking, so I'm, I'm thinking of doing just, you know, maybe just a little geometric pattern around the brim of the hat. I cast on 48 stitches uh, on a four and a half millimeter, then I'm going to switch to 10. And then if I have to increase, depending on what stitch I, stitches I decide to do, I'll just do a band of color work, and then I'll just do a regular uh, closure at the top because I'm not clever enough to figure out how to do a completely patterned hat. So that'll be really sweet to go with my sweater. Yeah, so that's from my bookshelf. Excellent books, uh, great, great reference books to have uh, on your bookshelf, if, especially if you're thinking of designing your own garment. So I've been very interested in uh, traditional ways of knitting. And in general, I am a thrower when I knit. I hold the working yarn in my right hand as a general rule. Uh, when I knit stranded, I do two hands, the dominant, the pattern color in my left and the uh, uh, background color in my right hand. And I did teach myself how to do continental knitting and continental pearl, the Norwegian pearl that uh, Arnie and Carlos teach on their videos. But I also wanted to try, I've been watching uh, uh, more of the traditional ways of knitting and I ran into a couple of videos with Hazel Tyndall who I think she has a record for the world's fastest knitter, and she uses a knitting belt. So I went online to see if I could find someone uh, to make me a belt, and I was successful, and I bought, I bought a, a knitting belt. So here, I'm going to show it to you up close here. Um, this is made by a lady in Lyme Regis, I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, it's the name of the shop is Bygone Yarny Stuff, and I'll, I'll put her link below. And I bought a leather knitting belt, belt with horse hair, stuffed, saddle stitched. And here, here it is. And I'm, um, what I'm doing is I'm, um, I'm breaking it in. So Hazel Tyndall said to, um, you can, if it's brand new, you can, you can move it around a little bit. And I'm knitting, I'm just practicing my garter stitch with uh, this yarn. I'm just, I just did a little, I'm just doing a little swatch here. These two yarns are, this, these two yarns are linen quill from Pearl Soho. And I'm thinking, I'm going to try to make the half and half triangles wrap using the knitting belt and these really long DPNs. They're 35. See these here are my three and a half. I also ordered some pins from Lorna. Uh, Lorna has a YouTube channel where she demonstrates how to use the knitting belt and how to also how to speed up your knitting. So I bought two and a half millimeter, 3.25 millimeter, 3.5 millimeter, four, four millimeter. These are prim aluminum, set of five. And I've been having fun every day. I'm practicing for at least 15 or 20 minutes, sometimes longer, um, knitting with the belt. Uh, just getting the, the hang of it. But I'm, I'm a little bit perplexed because I see two basically different methods that people are using with their knitting belt. 
So I see sort of like the Stephanie Pearl McPhee lever knitting style where they, um, you, you make these big, big movements, almost like playing a guitar. You know, big, big movements, very fast, very big movements. They say it's Irish cottage knitting. And then when you watch Hazel, she just does little tiny flicks. And Lorna also says to keep the motions small to work at the tips of the needles. So I, I, again, there's just a lot of different styles of knitting. If you use a knitting belt, um, I'd love to hear hear about it. Um, I don't know what possessed me to do this. I'm, I'm 62 years old. I'm learning a new way to knit. But um, I've only been knitting for about 10 years, so um, I don't feel like I'm too entrenched with my, you know, my patterns. But, but anyway, here was a little insert that she gave me. It talks about the knitting, the history of the knitting belt. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about, um, about improving my skills. One thing I noticed right away is that my tension was very even uh, in the little swatch here. So what do, you th what do you think of these two colors for a half and half wrap? This is Robin's Egg Blue and this is I think called Rhubarb. The only thing is I don't think I'm going to be able to fit to two whatever 200 stitches on this um, this size needle so I'm sure there's a workaround but uh, if, if that doesn't work I'll find some other uh, wrap or something that I could practice on with my knitting belt so uh, yeah I'm still trying to figure out um, you know the best place to put it on my waist some people sort of wrap it around their their thigh or their knee so yeah, I will include some video uh, in a future episode of how I'm getting along with this knitting belt. And if, again, if you if you use a knitting belt and you have, have any resources for me or any tips or tricks, I'd love to hear about them in the comments below. Well, that's all we have time for today, friends. I think I've shared everything I want to share. Uh, do stay tuned for next week when the Breed of the Week will be Perindale. And until then, uh, I hope you're well. I hope you are finding lots of time to do some crafty things and you're staying healthy and safe. All right, till next Friday, take care everyone and we'll see you real soon.